Beloved, today as we begin our journey towards the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ in this Christmas season, I would that you hear how the gospel writer Luke begins the journey to Bethlehem, not with the birth of Jesus, but rather with the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. If you're able, won't you hear the reading of the word of God from Luke chapter one, beginning in verse number five, as I read in your hearing from the New International Version of God's holy word. Luke chapter one, beginning in verse number five. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth could not conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was afraid and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is to never take wine or another fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to lure their God and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife, <laughs> she's well along in years also. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant for five months and remained in seclusion. She said, the Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from among the people. Back up to verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Today, as we begin this journey towards the manger, to celebrate the birth of the Messiah, I want to challenge you to have great expectations. Great expectations. One of the things I enjoy most about this Christmas season are the songs of our Savior's birth. As you scroll through the radio, especially Sirius XM, you'll find that there are stations dedicated to the carols of Christmas. You can't escape, O holy night. You're going to hear, O come all ye faithful. Joy to the world will be sung in repetition. And you know we're going to hear some of the classics. Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. The Temptations' Silent Night. Donny Hathaway's This Christmas. Boys to Men, Let It Snow. And of course, Nat King Cole crooning out chestnuts roasting 
on an open fire. It made me think of some of my favorite Christmas carols, and I want to share with you that the first song I learned for Christmas was not a carol. It was not even out of the hymn book, whether it was from a commercial. Now, I know it wasn't a Christmas carol, but I would sing it every Christmas season to remind my parents what they needed to buy me. If you were raised in the 70s and grew up in the 80s like me, you probably remember the lyrics to this song. It's not a carol, but we sing it in Christmas. The lyrics go a little something like this. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. They got a million different toys that I can play with, from bikes to trains to video games. It's the coolest toy store there is. I don't want to grow up because, baby, if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. I learned that song. It would sing those lyrics every Christmas. And I didn't know that that song was teaching me then one of the most valuable lessons of life that I would come to learn. And that is simply this, that growing up isn't fun. Adulting is overrated. Maturing is not all fun and games. And you want to remain a kid as long as you can. Because one of the inevitable experiences of growing up, of becoming an adult, of maturing, is learning to be hurt, to deal with disappointment, about being betrayed, about being let down. It is impossible to grow through life and not have to deal with the fact that people will break your heart. People will disappoint you. And multiple times in your life, you're going to be shocked to find out who someone really is when you find out they are not what you thought they were. And in response to being hurt, being lied on, being lied to, being betrayed, being disappointment, we all have a tendency to lower our expectations of people. One of the life lessons of growing up is expectation management. Expectation management is one of the self-protective tools that we employ over our lives. Because we have found out that when there's no expectation, there can be no disappointment. Matter of fact, I would argue with you that the more you grow in life, the less benefit of the doubt you give to people. The more candles you put on your cake, the less people you trust in life. The further you go in life, the less people you invite to go with you. Because expecting less is the safest way of keeping ourselves from being hurt. You can't escape the reality that people can't be trusted, that people will fall through on their word, that they don't keep their promises, that people will look you in your eye and boldly lie to you without blinking, that oftentimes people don't do what they say they're going to do. Lowering expectation is an inescapable lesson of life that helps us learn how to deal with people. And although lowering expectation is the safest way to deal with people, it is not the best way to live with God. The older you get, the less you trust people. But the older you get, the more you ought to trust God. God literally desires us to live life with the highest expectation of what God will fulfill and perform in our lives on a daily basis. Hear me, beloved, it is the enemy of righteousness that wants you to live with famished faith. It's the enemy of righteousness that wants you to live life with hobbled hope and defeated dreams. But God, God expects you to have high hopes. God expects you to wake up every day believing that the best is yet to come. God wants you to look at the storms and the struggles of life and believe that in the midst of it all, it's going to work together for your good. God wants you to believe that every promise he's made will be fulfilled, that even in the worst of times, that our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. God wants you to have great expectations of what he's always on the verge of doing in your life. That is one of the 
first lessons of Christmas that is pressed upon us, especially by the gospel writer of Luke. Luke reminds us that the story of the birth of Jesus does not begin with a babe in Bethlehem. It doesn't even begin with Mary or a manger, but rather it begins in Jerusalem with the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist to his father, Zechariah, and his mother, Elizabeth, both of whom are childless and old in age. God dispatches the angel Gabriel, the same one who's going to show up in a few verses in Bethlehem, excuse me, to speak to Mary and announce the birth of Jesus. That same Gabriel shows up in Jerusalem to give a message to Zechariah. He comes to Zechariah to tell him, listen, God has heard your prayer and I've got some good news for you. You and Elizabeth are going to have a child, not just a child, a son. And not just any ordinary son, but he's going to be great. He's going to walk in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit before he's even born. Because of him, people will be turned back unto the Lord. He's going to prepare the path for Jesus Christ. Your son is going to be great. And Zacharias' first response to this good news of Gabriel is one of doubt, disbelief. He says to Gabriel, how can this be? Because I'm old and Elizabeth is old and there's no way two old folk like us are going to have a child. Beloved, in Luke chapter one, we encounter a Zachariah whose faith has been fractured. A Zachariah whose belief has bottomed out. A Zachariah whose trust is on zero. A Zachariah who's come to the place of believing that God will not perform what God has said, that his prayer will go unanswered and that he will die without a child. In spite of the fact that Gabriel is giving him good news, he has low expectation that it will ever come to pass. Why? Has Zechariah lost his hope? When did his faith zero out? How is it that Zechariah has no expectation of God anymore? What has happened to put Zechariah in this place? Well, I suggest to you that part of the answer comes in the very beginning of how Luke tells his story. He uses five words that, that may have escaped our attention. Luke begins with a timestamp. Not a year, not a season, but this is what Luke says, in the time of Herod. In the time of Herod. Beloved, don't let that escape you. Those words tell us something. Because Herod was a bad season for the Jews. In the time of Herod was a time of Roman occupation. In the time of Herod, was a season of injustice and mass violence and death. And the time of Herod was a season of financial abuse. In the time of Herod was a season when the Pharisees were manipulating the people. In the time of Herod was a time of inescapable evil that no Israelite could escape. In the time of Herod may have been in the time of COVID during a pandemic when variations move from Delta to Omicron and vaccines became divisive. In the time of Herod, could have read in the time of another school shooting when a teenager and his mother and father conspired to kill innocent life. In the time of Herod, may as well have read in the time of resurgent racism. In the time when more laws were passed to restrict voting than the carrying of submachine guns openly in our streets. In the time of Herod was a time when white corporations were now making millions of dollars selling in abundance would cause black and brown men to be incarcerated for carrying in small supply. In the time of Herod may as well have been a time when Christmas trees were burned and called hate crimes because they were a Christian symbol. But at the same time, people were denying the burning of crosses and critical race theory because we wanted to hide the truth of our history. In the time of Herod was a time of pandemic 
and ism and oppression and privilege and hatred and violence. It's no wonder that in that time, Zachariah had lost his expectation of God. Because when you live day in and day out in the time of Herod, week in and week out in the time of Herod, month in and month out in the time of Herod, year in and year out in the time of Herod, it can affect your belief. It can ruin your trust. It can lower your expectation. Beloved, when you live in the season of Herod, it'll affect how you believe in God. When you live under the pandemic of Herod, it will lower your expectation of God. When you have to deal with the antics of Herod and Karens, it will wear on your belief that something great is happening. So Zechariah, in the time of Herod, says to Gabriel, how can this be? Do you know what we've been dealing with? Do you know how old I am? Do you know how much stuff I've had to see? Do you know how weary this has been? Do you know how day in and day out this is taking its toll on me? Even though Jesus is coming, there's a dark cloud hanging over Zachariah because of the time of Herod. The same way there's a dark cloud looming over our celebration of Christmas in 2021. And when Zachariah shares his doubt, his disbelief, his lowered expectation, listen to what Gabriel says. Gabriel says, because you don't believe, because your expectations are low, because you doubt, because you don't have trust, because you've allowed what you're living through to change what you expect God to do, he says, I've got to punish you with silence. You will not speak until your son is born and you see God do what I told you God is going to do. Gabriel punishes Zachariah. Now, you got to know this makes me curious. Why would Zechariah be punished? It just seems reasonable that when you live in the time of Herod and God has not answered prayer and darkness has been on the land so long that it seems reasonable to have some doubt and some disbelief and not trust. Why is Zechariah punished? Why is he silenced? Why does Gabriel come down hard on Zechariah? Well, well, allow me to tell you there are three things about Zechariah we know that may give us a hint as to why he is punished and why God expects us to expect great things from him. Here's one of the first things we know about Zechariah. You ready? We know that Zechariah is old. Touch someone or, or chat out and say Zechariah is old. The Bible tells us he's old. Verse 7 says he's old. In verse 18, he declares that he's old. Zachariah is an old man. Now, what you ought to be wondering right here is how old is Zachariah? There's no biblical answer. We do know that when the Bible uses the term old age, it typically refers to someone who's at least 60. If you do some extra biblical research, you'll find out that there is a Muslim tradition that declares that Zechariah was 92 years old when Gabriel shows up. So Zechariah is somewhere between 60 and 92 when Gabriel shows up and says, you're about to have a son. That's why he's punished. You know why? Because Zechariah, you are too old to be doubting God in this season of your life, if you've made it to 60 and you're as old as 92, the one thing you ought to have in your life by that stage is some faith in God. Because by 60, you've seen God do great things. By 60, you know God answers prayer. By 60, you've seen God make a way out of no way. And I don't know who I came to preach to on this Christmas season, but I came by to pull a Gabriel in your life and declare unto you that you are too old to doubt God right here and right now. 
Listen, listen, listen. I can understand a teenager not having faith in God. I can understand a new college student wondering if God's going to make a way. I can understand someone under 25 not knowing how God will show up. But if you've crossed 30 in your life, I declare unto you, you are too daggone old to doubt God in this season of your life. By now, you know God answers prayer. By now, you've seen God make a way out of no way. By now, you know you've trusted in God and God has not failed you by this season of your life. You are too old to doubt God, to not believe in God, to not have faith in God. Is there anybody watching who's mature enough to raise your hand and declare, I'm too old to doubt God. God's done too much. God's answered too many prayers. God's made too many ways. God's moved too many times. I've seen him do it time and time and time again, and I'm too old to doubt God right here and right now. Y'all, I need you to pray for me. Um, Next Saturday, my oldest child turns 18. Next Saturday, I've I've, I've got a wannabe grown man living in my house. Next Saturday, I've got an 18-year-old. And as he begins to turn 18, I'm now adding him to one of my credit cards because I want him to develop a credit score. But before I do that, I sat down with him to review some basics of credit for him to understand how your credit score is determined, for you to understand how your balances affect your credit, for you to understand how your payment record affects your credit, for you to understand how your utilization affects your credit, to understand how many accounts and how long you've had them affect your credit. So we sat down and I'm trying to help him understand credit And he says, well, dad, what's my credit score? I said, well, let's go online. We went online and I pulled up his FICA score. His score is zero. He has no credit score. She said to me, dad, what does that mean? I said, well, son, the simplest way for me to explain it is let you know that with a zero credit score, nobody trusts you. No bank trusts you. No lending institution trusts you. Nobody who gives out money trusts you because you have a zero credit score and you have no record. And then I shared with him my score. I said, well, let's look at daddy's. And I was proud to pull up and show him that daddy's got a 780 credit score because I'm serious and diligent about my credit. He said to me, well, dad, what does that mean? I said, well, son, this simply means this, that banks trust me, that mortgages can be made to me, that I can get loans because I've got a good credit score. He said, well, dad, how do you get a good credit score? I said, it's real simple, son. I've got a good record. I've got a record of making payment. I've got a record of doing what I said I was going to do. I've got a record of fulfilling my debt obligation. I've got a record of showing up on time. I've got a record of making my payments on time. And because I've got a good record, I've got a good score. And people trust me because when you don't have a good record, you don't have a good score and nobody trusts you. But when your record is solid, when you've done what you said you're going to do, when you fulfilled your obligations, when you showed up on time, people ought to trust you. Somebody you just missed the life lesson right here. The reason you ought to trust God is because God's got a good record with you. God has shown up when he said he would. God has fulfilled what he said he would do. God has made payment. God has fulfilled his debt obligation. God has a good record and you ought to trust God. How can you not believe that it'll work together for your good? How can you not believe that all sickness is not unto death? How can you not believe that no weapon will be formed against you shall prosper because God has a good record and whatever God said he would do, God has already done. Do me a favor, if you're chatting and watching, put out there, God's got a good record with me. God has shown up. God has made ways. God has opened doors. God has fulfilled his word. God has worked it together for my good. God has got me out of mess after mess after mess. And when I look at his record, his score goes up and I trust God with everything in my life. Zachariah, you're too old not to trust God. We know that Zachariah is old. Can I tell you something else we know about Zachariah? We know what he does. Zachariah is a priest. Zachariah's job is to go into the temple 
receive the word of the Lord and come back out and share it with the people. As a matter of fact, when he goes into the temple in Luke chapter one, the Bible says that everybody's outside praying, waiting for him to come back out because the people need to know what God has said. The people need to know that God is still real. There's somebody that needs to know we can still trust in God. There's somebody that needs to believe that with God, all things are able. That God can do whatever God said he would do. The people are waiting on Zechariah. Zechariah goes into the temple. He hears the good news of Gabriel and he doubts it. And Gabriel silences him. Why? Watch this. There's a difference between the announcement of John the Baptist and the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Stay with me. When Gabriel announces the birth of Jesus, to whom does he announce it? To Mary, the mother. When Gabriel announces the birth of John the Baptist, to whom does he announce it? To Zechariah, the father. No, don't you miss this. Mary gets word that she's going to be pregnant. But Gabriel tells Zechariah. And what is the assumption? That if I tell Zechariah, who will Zechariah tell? Elizabeth. Zechariah, your assignment is to receive the word and share it with Elizabeth. And could it be that Gabriel silences Zechariah because when he hears his doubt that Zechariah expresses, Gabriel understands that because you don't believe it, the danger is that you will go back to Elizabeth and you will not share the good news, but you will share your doubt and you will discourage Elizabeth who needs to believe that God is able. Here it is, don't you miss this, that Gabriel silences Zechariah so that Zechariah cannot discourage Elizabeth. Elizabeth needs to believe. Elizabeth needs to know. Elizabeth needs to trust. Elizabeth needs to have some faith. And I've got to shut you up because with your negativity and your doubting, you will discourage someone who needs to believe. Beloved, let me tell you something. You can always identify the Zacharias in your life by what comes out of their mouth. You can always identify those who've lost their trust in God, whose faith is failing, who have more doubt than they do belief because they're always negative. They're always overcritical. They're always fault finding. They're always trying to tell you what can't be. They're always speaking death over your life. They're always trying to discourage you and tell you what you can't do and what won't happen. I am tired of Zacharias in my life. And as you enter this Christmas season, come by and tell you that every now and then you need to pull a Gabriel on your Zacharias. You need to hear that negativity and that doubt and that critical spirit and that fault finding. And you need to shut their mouths. You need to close your ears. You need to look them in the eyeball and say, would you please just shut up because I'm tired of the negativity. I need folk in my life who remind me that if God be for me, he's more than the world against me. I need folk who remind me that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I need folk who remind me that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can ask or think. You need to shut up some Zacharias in your life. What the world needs from us is not negativity and not hatred and not doubt and not disbelief, but a generation of believers who walk out of the temple declaring God is able, who walk out of church saying the Lord will make a way, who get offline in worship and declare that God does answer prayer. Is there anybody watching today who's going to leave worship with a determination to speak life and truth and faith and belief? God needs some folk who know how to convey his power to the world. 
there's so much negativity and hatred and isms in the world. God is looking for you and for me to share a different word. Zachariah, you're too old to doubt God. Zachariah, you can't go around discouraging people. But here's the third thing we know about Zachariah. You ready? Gabriel has come into his life. Gabriel is standing in front of Zachariah. Yo, yo, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Zachariah says, how can this be? I'm too old. And notice how Gabriel responds. When Mary wonders how she's going to get pregnant, Gabriel gives her an answer. When, when Mary wonders, how can this be? Watch what Gabriel says. He says, Mary, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit's going to show up. You're going to become pregnant. Go see Elizabeth. God will deal with Joseph. Gabriel gives Mary the answer and the explanation. But when Zachariah asks Gabriel how it's going to happen, Gabriel doesn't give an explanation. Gabriel responds like he's offended. Watch it, read the text. Zechariah says, how can this be? Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel. Okay, pause, you missed it. Zechariah says, how can this be? I'm old. Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel. It's almost as if Gabriel flexes on Jeremiah, on Zechariah. Zechariah says, how can this be? Gabriel says, man, do you know who I am? Do you realize who's standing right in front of you? Do you realize whose presence you're in? I'm Gabriel. I'm the messenger of miracles. When I show up, God's about to do something. When I speak, God is already at work. When I show up in your life, you ought to know what God is able to do. Gabriel is offended that Zacharias in his presence and doesn't believe what God is able to do. Zachariah, don't you understand that Gabriel has shown up? That Gabriel is the messenger of miracles. And Gabriel is offended. He says to Zachariah, the fact that I'm here and you're in my presence is a miracle in itself. And so you, you, you are in the presence of a miracle but you doubt that God can perform a miracle. Don't, don't, don't miss this. This is good. You're in the presence of a miracle. And you doubt that God can perform a miracle. How can you stand in the miraculous and doubt the miraculous? How can you stand in the favor of God and doubt the favor of God? How can you wake up in grace and mercy and doubt Grace and mercy. Goodbye, y'all. I got to go. I came by to tell someone today, though, every day of your life, you wake up next to Gabriel. Someone say, well, hold on, Reverend. I ain't never had an angel speak to me. Yes, but you've been in the presence of a miracle. Every morning you wake up and you're in your right mind. That's a miracle. Every time your children make it home safely from school, that's a miracle. Every time you've got enough money to pay your month, that's a miracle. Every time you sin and don't drop dead, that's a miracle. Every time you open up the refrigerator and there's food to eat, that's a miracle. Every time you feel warm air blowing through the vent of your home, that's a miracle. You wake up every morning in the miracle of God. And because I wake up in miracles, because I walk in miracles, because I live in miracles, I believe that God is able to do the miraculous. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but raise your expectation of what God is able to do because he does the miraculous in your life every single day. God shows you Gabriel every day. Stop listening to the Zacharias. And know that you're too old to doubt God right here. So as we make our way to that Christmas tree, as we journey to that manger, 
As we gear up for a new year, I want to challenge you to have some great expectations of what God is going to do.